Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? I am absolutely wonderful. It's uh, too early in the morning, damn it. Well, we, uh, we'd be remiss right at the top of the show if we didn't say, be careful what you wish for, I guess, but congratulations. It's been all over the news for about a week or so that, uh, well, you have even less time now. So uh, <laughs> as for, that's why we're doing it in four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. We're doing this crack of dawn, uh, on the day, the episode drops. Sometimes we can get ahead last week's episode. We taped a week in advance and you would have gotten it early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. But today's show, man, we're uh, barely going to make it, but we are excited to be here. And congratulations uh, are in order. Would you have thought a handful of years ago, Bruce, that uh, you'd go from talking about chocolate titties on a podcast with me here to now being perhaps the second most powerful man in wrestling? Stop. I'm just saying. I mean, without the last name McMahon, you got to be right at the tippy top of the food chain. Just saying. Stop. Well, let's talk about John Tenta. Of course, Earthquake. And man, I got to tell you, this is an episode I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, back when we did uh, polls in 2016 and 2017, I was all in on Earthquake and he just never won. But damn it, we're making it happen because he would have been celebrating a birthday coming up here in a few days. He was born on June 22nd, 1963 in British Columbia. And the first time I see John Tenta is watching primetime wrestling or superstars of wrestling or something like that back in 89. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about that segment, but when did you first meet John Tenta? I first met John Tenta in, I believe Rochester, New York. Um, I don't know. It was upstate, maybe Buffalo. One of the two, I know it was upstate New York and John had come in for a tryout. I remember going back and looking at this huge mountain of a man he was a big, big man, tall and just big. And people have been talking about him and Vince said, can the guy talk? And I walked down and I introduced myself and said, Hey, let me ask you a question, man. I said, uh, you know, can you talk? Can you cut a promo? And he stood up and immediately went, you want me to cut a promo? And he went into this whole big, long promo and I, Sat there and I said, okay, well, I guess you can cut a promo then. And, uh, the rest as they say is history. Let's, uh, start at the beginning. He grows up a big wrestling fan, specifically, uh, Don Leo, Jonathan and Gene Kaniski. And they both inspire him at a young age to want to become a pro wrestler. And he decides the route there is to first become an amateur wrestler. And he does well becoming a Canadian junior champion in 81. And shortly after his 18th birthday, he finishes sixth in the super heavyweight category at the world junior wrestling championships in Vancouver in 83, he won the teenage world championship and got the only takedown against another future wrestler, the late great Gary Albright. 
and he winds up winning an athletic scholarship to LSU where he's going to compete in NCAA collegiate wrestling. And at LSU, he was nicknamed big John. He lettered for the tiger varsity wrestling team and participated with the football team. And eventually LSU would drop varsity wrestling to comply with title nine and 85, which forced Tenta to choose a new sport. So he walks onto the football team and plays in some uh, games as a defensive lineman. He's uh, sort of known as the quiet giant and joins the rugby union for the LSU rugby club. So he's very athletic, which I think some of our younger fans may be shocked with, you know, just when you see his physique and, and presentation. But once he leaves LSU, he actually does go to Japan to train as a sumo wrestler. He'd been recruited by a former Yokozuna who met Tenta on a trip to Vancouver. So in October of 85, he finds himself joining a sumo stable. This is just so much to unpack. What an unusual, you know, trek into the business. First of all, being from Canada and then getting into NCAA wrestling and LSU and then trying your hand at football and rugby and then sumo. It reads like, uh, I don't know, a feel good movie. Talk to me about his inspiration though. Cause these are a couple of names that some of our listeners might not be familiar with Don, Leo, Jonathan, and Gene Kaniski. Who were they and, and, and what was their impact on the game? Well, Don, Leo, Jonathan was the Mormon giant and he stood about six foot 10. I'm guessing now, but he was uh, an extraordinarily tall Man, he was very giant-like. He had an incredible rivalry with Andre the Giant early on in Andre's career. And Don Leo Jonathan was a guy, he was an attraction in and of himself. He used to travel across the country, across the world, to come in as a special attraction for local markets. Uh, so I actually got to see him wrestle twice, and he did one of the weirdest things that I'd ever seen in a match was he started unlacing his boots in the middle of the match. And then it worked a little more and then he would unlace his boots and, you know, have the long string hanging down from his boots. And then he would finally get the boot off, get the both boots off. And then he would wrestle the rest of the match barefoot. And it wasn't really for, you know, like, uh, somebody was working his ankle or working the leg in any way or stomping the, it was weird. He was, he was different. Um, met him many years later at, at a convention and a very, very nice man, just as polite and kind as could be, but had traveled, traveled the world as a giant and also traveled the world as the opponent of Andre the Giant for a long time. So he was, he was the first, I think he may have even been a little bit before Andre as far as being billed as a true giant. And then Gene Kaniski, good Lord. Conrad, who did Dory Funk Jr. defeat for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship? Gene Kaniski. Gene Kaniski! Canada's greatest athlete. Kaniski was uh, the NWA World Heavyweight Champion from, I believe, 66 to 69 or 68. Um... Big brawling. He was a Canadian football player and had a horrible body, <laughs> but he had the same promo. You know, I'm the the greatest athlete from Canada, the greatest Canadian athlete ever. And he was big. They called him Big Thunder. Gene Kaniski was in those days, your NWA champion had to be a legitimate tough guy because they were always afraid someone was going to try and a shoot on you and steal double cross you and steal the NWA title. So you had to be tough and able to handle yourself. And Kaniski was double tough. Um, again, another one who very, very nice man. And I worked with his son, Kelly. I worked a little bit with Nick. Nick wasn't in the business as long. Nice. I think Nick had more of an aptitude for the business than Kelly did, but, um, Kelly Kaniski was someone I, I took under my wing a little bit when he came to Houston because he was Gene Kaniski's son and he was really a fish out of water and wasn't sure that he wanted to be in the wrestling business. Well, let's talk about John Tenta venturing to Japan 
When he goes over, he's six foot six, 422 pounds. He catches on to the sumo lifestyle and sport very quickly. In fact, he won all of his 25 matches and then ultimately decides, Hey, this might not be for me in July of 1986. He would say, uh, nothing I've ever done, not football, not college wrestling compares with the kind of physical abuse you inflict on your body in sumo. And we should mention the sumo world frowned on the large tattoo of a tiger on his left arm. And he would have to, uh, get it removed by skin grafts. If he was going to do higher level competition in Japan, tattoos mean something totally different than they do over here, but he loses a good bit of weight during this whole sumo training. I think by the time he actually jumps into pro wrestling, he's down to 380 pounds and he down to yes. From four something. Uh, and he makes his professional wrestling debut for all Japan on May 1st, 1987. He wrestled in Japan for like 18 months, teamed with a lot of names. You're probably familiar with the great Kabuki, uh, Jumbo Saruta, uh, giant Baba during his time there. He's also working with Terry Funk. And it's important to remember John Tenta is only 24 when all of this is happening. And, uh, he decides to, uh, start packing the weight back on gets over 400 pounds. Giant Baba asked him to lose the weight, but John didn't. And when his second contract expired, Baba didn't renew him for a third one. Did you ever talk about John or talk to John about his time in Japan, whether it be with sumo or, or working with Baba? A little bit. And John enjoyed his time in Japan overall culturally. And I, I think that if I had my choice of, if I couldn't live in the United States of America, I would probably venture to Japan just because I enjoy the culture there and I enjoy the food and I just think it's pretty neat. And John was the same way. John enjoyed his time there. Wasn't really crazy about the sumo training, but he, he did enjoy his time in Japan and he loved learning the craft while he was there. So it was, I think it was still kind of near and dear to his heart and he, he liked living there and he liked being there. But I think at the same time he was happy to, to get out and come back to North America. Yeah, he is. He comes back and works in Vancouver for Al Tomko's NWA all-star wrestling. He starts out as a baby face, but later turns heel and he's managed by a name that I, even I have to admit, I'm not familiar with gentleman, Jonathan Sayers. Do you know anything about gentleman, Jonathan Sayers? I do not. I have no idea. I want to say, I thought it was Jim holiday, but I don't really know. Maybe one of our listeners out there is going to do their research and come back and go, Hey Bruce, you dumbass. Yeah. Talk to me please about, don't, please don't do that. I'm sensitive. Okay. He comes into the company, the WWF in March of 89 and wrestles two matches under his real name. And he joins full time in September of uh, 89. And we'll talk about how all that comes to be, but who would have sort of been the scout or the liaison to put Tenta on you guys radar in early 89? Well, um, I believe that they received some tapes and some promos and different things from John but I think it was Bret Hart originally who mentioned Tenta and Pat saw him, Pat and Vince saw him and brought him in for this tryout. And upon seeing his size and the way that he could move, Tenta could move for a big man and was very agile. And they put him in the ring for a tryout. Tenta killed it. We should mention March of 89 Hulkamania is still running wild in a big way. And for years and years, the formula had been a quote unquote heel factory, whether it's a Bam Bam Bigelow or a King Kong Bundy or an Andre the Giant or a Nakim or a big boss man. We need a big hulking individual, pardon the pun, to challenge Hulk Hogan and take that big boot and the leg drop and tend to checks all those boxes, does he not? Yes, he does. He was a big, strong, menacing heel that Hulk could overcome his first match after signing in September of 89 happens on September 21st, where he wrestles as a lumberjack character named earthquake Evans and was billed as being from the Northern Yukon territory. He's managed by slick before eventually defeating Paul Roma. 
this is not the way we're going to remember his debut. Instead, that's going to happen on the November 11th edition of superstars. That's an in-ring segment with Dino Bravo and the intercontinental champion at the time, the ultimate warrior. John is seated in the crowd and was randomly chosen by mean Gene and Bravo's manager, Jimmy Hart to sit on Bravo's back during a push-up contest with the ultimate warrior. And of course he sits right down on the world's strongest man, Dino Bravo and Dino pops out these push-ups, No problem. Here comes the ultimate warrior. Now Tenta's is going to sit on his back and instead he jumps on his back and they all jump him and ta-da earthquake is now a character. John Tenta has a gig here, but that wasn't the original idea. What can you tell us about this lumberjack version of earthquake earthquake Evans from the Northern Yukon territory and managed by slick. That was just something that we tried and put out there for a tryout to say, Hey, does this work? Yes or no. And Hulk saw him and Hulk was like, Hey, fuck man, there's, there could be money in that big bastard. The first time that, that you saw him on TV, the other the other important part that was so, when you look back on it, is funny when people watch it. They go, "Oh my God, there's Earthquake sitting in the audience." Yeah, because we sat him directly across from the hard cameras, right? So that he would be in damn near every shot. Well, he wasn't every hard camera shot, but after a while, you know, it, you watch it later and you realize, man, he's right in the middle of every friggin' shot. It was just a nice little subtlety until it was time for him to come on down, you know, earthquake, come on down. But it was a way to introduce him. You bring him in, you bring him in on top and put him with the ultimate warrior. So it was a good way to debut him and a good way to, to get him rolling with things because people didn't expect it and they bought it because he walked in the front door he was smiling and laughing with everybody and just being a big fan and to the, to the crowd that night, they were in shock. It really is one of the cooler ways I've ever seen a character debuted. I mean, even when he climbs in the ring, I just randomly happened to cross this because the network just uploaded a bunch of old episodes, um, from November's, uh, primetime wrestling from 89. So I managed to just randomly select the one where his uh, debut was covered and man, it's, it's beautifully done. He comes down the stairs, crosses the guardrail, climbs in is having a conversation with mean Gene, just like you would imagine a fan would. He introduces himself as John from West Virginia. And, uh, they ask him how much he weighs. And he says, you know, 440 pounds or whatever. And we're off to the races. It was just a phenomenal way to debut the character. Of course, we know he's going to become known as the Canadian earthquake. And he is going to be managed by Dino Bravo's manager, Jimmy Hart. Ultimately, why was Jimmy a better fit for earthquake than slick? Do you think? Because of the, at the time, the Dino Bravo connection and the Bravo issue with ultimate warrior. And that's kind of where they were. And it was a way for earthquake to come in and learn at the teat of one Dino Bravo. Really, really fun stuff here. Uh, of course, eventually we know that the Canadian part of the name is going to be dropped and he's just going to become earthquake. What's interesting is, you know, we know his sort of claim to fame, uh, over the following summer is going to be working with Hulk Hogan and things get really white hot on that and, and culminate at SummerSlam, but he debuts with a situation with the ultimate warrior. And we don't get to see like a pay-per-view feud with those two. What, why does he debut with the warrior, but then wind up with Hogan? I mean, I understand we're trying to further the Dino Bravo issue, but it does feel like if you're trying to build your quote unquote, next Hogan and ultimate warrior, wouldn't you want that matchup or maybe not? Well, not at the time because they still wanted to finish him up with Dino Bravo. And it was just a nice way to introduce a new talent probably should have and definitely could have, but they didn't. And he was so impressive. He being earthquake was so impressive upon his debut that Hulk sitting there looking at him going, he needed an opponent and big man was perfect opponent. Yes, he was. 
We should mention his first pay-per-view appearance is when he replaces Barry Windham on Randy Savage's 89 Survivor Series team. Earthquake will eliminate Hercules and survive the match along with Savage and Dino Bravo. Um, was there ever consideration with making him and Bravo a tag team? You know, this feels like sort of the end of Dino Bravo's run. And maybe that could have been something that gave him a little more longevity. Yeah, there was. However, Tenta was able to really get over on his own and be that big, nasty single star, be that big, nasty heel that we really needed to stand on their own. And the feeling was Dino would have brought him down. Well, he winds up debuting for WrestleMania at WrestleMania six. He gets a win over Hercules. And from there, earthquake gets the biggest break of his career. And well, most careers, when you start a feud with Hulk Hogan, their feud starts in May of 1990. Uh, the earthquake character would attack Hulk Hogan from behind on a show. You might've heard of Bruce. It's the brother love show and earthquake uh, winds up hitting Hulk several times with his earthquake splash. And, uh, this is all done because Hulk's going to be out of action for several months because he's off to film the movie suburban commando. You were there when all this happened. what did you think of the segment and the way it was shot and put together and, uh, what followed up with the whole get Will Hulk promotion that you guys did. <laughs> uh, tremendous, man. It was, it was so damn good. And I was able to garner a shitload of heat off of that segment because it was on the brother love show and I was cheering him on. So his earthquake came and I cheered every single splash to Hulk and Hulk laid there and sold it. And I just tried to, get just rub some of that heat off on me as much as we possibly could. But it was, it was a different way. It was the first time that we did something on the set like that with a big star. And we had done the, um, boss man angle where it was kind of off the side to the set. And this was, Oh my God, it's this solid st- that has no give. Um, So it was, it was pretty good and it was able to take Hulk out. Distance makes the heart grow fonder and Hulk was able to go do his movie, take that time away and come back and have a ready-made opponent just simmering on the pot for him when he came back and was ready to go. I absolutely loved it. Uh, this get well Hulk promotion where fans were riding in and I think, I think you guys may have even did like a bracelet thing. I remember in the era, but tugboat is begging for sympathy from these little Hulksters, little Hulkamaniacs. But in reality, what was the plan for the company here with this campaign? Well, I mean, the plan was good Lord. You get a mailing list to be able to send out catalogs to and have fans ready made to be able to be the first to get the new merchandise, damn it, and sell magazines and everything else. Um, But the other idea behind it was Tugboat, who was new in the company, and Tugboat uh, had come in to try and make Tugboat the next Hulk and that next big baby face, and then eventually um, turn Tugboat heel into chic tugboat to get to our WrestleMania seven program. So tremendous. I mean, the genius behind, Hey, how do we sell our, how can we sell some more shit? Well, we could ship catalogs like everybody else. I mean, Lord knows that's how Sears Roebuck has made it all these years. Remember this is pre-internet and, uh, you guys do a letter writing campaign. Hey kids, don't you want to support Hulkster? Send him a letter here and magically. They start finding out about new Hulk Hogan jackets and bandanas and lunch boxes. It's just tremendous. The public service. Great stuff, man. I mean, really ahead of its time. We should also mention that, uh, if you want more info on the whole proposed chic tugboat angle, if that just blew your mind, you should go listen to our WrestleMania seven episode. It is phenomenal. Let's talk about the big payoff though. Hulk Hogan does come back to get revenge with earthquake at SummerSlam 1990. Uh, Hulk picks up a win by count out in 13 minutes and nine seconds. Meltzer would say that Hulk appeared to be around 270 pounds and looked way small next to earthquake. Um, 
of course he's been doing a movie here, but instead of it being a clean finish, it is a DQ finish. Uh, of course the megaphones involved. And so is Jimmy Hart and chat me up though. This is, uh, this is weird, at least in modern times, I think maybe, but although pay-per-view and TV were, were a big deal in that era too, the real money, or at least that's the way it was perceived at the time was in the house show business. So you didn't want to necessarily give away a clean finish here. If you thought maybe we could milk some more out of this angle and, and, and tour the country with these guys on top, right? Well, Hulk's return was at the end of the summer and we hadn't had the opportunity to take the match on the road yet. So for live events, Hulk versus earthquake would be a new match. And most of the time before we got to pay-per-view, you would either have a different match or if it was, it would kind of be the blow off on pay-per-view. And this worked exactly the opposite. The first match was on pay-per-view. Then they went into the live events and took them around the horn. So you really couldn't, you didn't want to get that decisive win and have Hulk be the hero here. You needed to continue the the heat between the two and continue to make sure that people want to see the Hulkster get to the goddamn earthquake. Earthquake takes a few chair shots after the match here, and his back is uh, showing those those uh, shots uh, pretty vividly. It's worth going back and checking out. I mean, to see, I don't know, uh, two and a quarter stars. I got to tell you the, um, the earthquake Hulk Hogan storyline. I mean, I know we're going to sort of start moving away from it. This one was a major one in my childhood. I mean, me and all of my friends, we were all about this and it feels like it lasted a lot longer than it really did. They weren't exactly done. I mean, at survivor series 90 earthquake would captain a team consisting of Dino Bravo, barbarian Haku and Hogan's team has tugboat boss man and Jim Duggan. And during the match, Earthquake would eliminate Boss Man, and Quake is eliminated when he and Tugboat are both counted out of the ring. And they would next meet up at the Royal Rumble match, where they're the last two end, and Hulk would eliminate Earthquake. But it feels like there may have been a little more meat on the bone in this Hogan Earthquake feud, just based on the tremendous way it was set up. Do you think that was scrapped too soon? Well, it. They let me put it this way: they definitely could have got more out of it. The reason that it kind of went away was simply because of the Sergeant Slaughter issue and, and all the Iraqi issue that we had going on at the time, and you needed to move Hulk beyond that. So, yes, it definitely could have gone on longer, but there was something else a little bit hotter at the time and timeliness as far as angles go. Yeah. The dreadful Iraqi horse shit, uh, over the next few months, earthquakes, not really involved in genius, ton, uh, not really involved in a ton of stuff. Uh, he defeats Greg Valentine at WrestleMania seven. And I don't know, it's gotta feel, I mean, if you're John Tenta, don't you feel a little defeated here? Like I'm not shitting on Greg Valentine, but damn, you've been working with Hulk Hogan on pay-per-views and now, well, not so much. Well, I think, yeah, anytime you go from working with the number one guy in the company to anybody else, it's going to be less than. But at the same time, Tenta was a big heel that could hold his own, and he was someone that uh, was able to to hold his own because he was so big and he could move. The, during, you know, somewhere in this time frame, too, there was a really horrible, tragic earthquake that took place. Um, I know there was one in San Francisco, but there was another one somewhere. I don't know if it was Mexico or Peru or I, somebody's going to tell me what an idiot I am for not knowing, but I don't remember. And a little bit of that, we had to kind of back off on mm. the earthquake character I got you. because to that audience, it was, it was offensive that we have a guy jumping around as the earthquake and squashing people when so many people had just experienced this horrible natural disaster. And, you know, the, when tornadoes would come through, they didn't want rock doing the F five because 
that's how they, if an F5 tornado came through, it was like, let's do something else. You just try to be a little bit sensitive to those things. And, and there was a point somewhere in here where we had to cool earthquake off a little bit. Just so people wouldn't be going, oh, WWE's promoting an earthquake. Hmm. Very kabuki-ish. Well, let's talk about something that uh, we've touched on a little bit before. In April of 91, there's a joint show over in Japan, uh, Super World of Sports. It's called the SWS Wrestle Dream. It's got 64,168 folks in the Tokyo Dome. Earthquake is going to wrestle, boy, I'm going to butcher this, Koji Kateo in a battle of two former sumo wrestlers. Uh, John picks up the win in six minutes and 10 seconds. And Meltzer would say, believe it or not, this match got the most heat of the card from a crowd standpoint. This was the best match on the card, but not from a wrestling standpoint. Both of these guys were very famous in Japan as sumo wrestlers before they got into wrestling and Kateo hasn't been able to shake his bad boy image with the general public. Uh, while some of the hardcore fans are beginning to cut him some slack when he works before a crowd that is largely not wrestling fans, he becomes the most over heel on the card. In turn, Tinta was the most over face on the card and everything both men did got a big reaction. The work itself was described as sluggish, but not awful with Tinta dominating most of the way to the big pops, two and a half stars. Two nights later, they're supposed to have a rematch, but Kateo won't work with Tinta when they got in the ring. He gets in a fighting pose with his fingers pointed out, symbolizing that he's going to attack John's eyes. John gets visibly upset, dares him to make a move, which he didn't. And not long after he legitimately kicks the ref and gets dehued. Then he takes the mic and tells the fans that wrestling is fake. And he refuses to lose to him a second time as was scripted. The plug is quickly pulled on his mic and he's fired from the company. What a fucking story, man. What do you remember hearing about this? Well, you did good with the first part of, uh, his name. It's, uh, it's Katow. Koji Katow. And Koji was a sumo champion that we had brought over with Tenru to be a tag team and do some different things. And green as grass but had a fucking chip on his shoulder you wouldn't believe. He walked in feeling that he was tougher, bigger, better than anybody that we had on the roster and carried himself that way in the locker room. Mm. So that right away, people were looking at him like, okay, you big bastard. You know, hey, we're putting you over in here, but if you want to go, we'll go type thing. I remember the at first it was – uh, demolition that were in there with him. Um, Brian Adams worked with him a little bit and he was just shitty green stiff and considered himself a shooter, but he just was kind of an asshole. Really? By the time they got over there, the dream match for Japan, because John had been a sumo and, and had been a good sumo someone that people knew about, they wanted that match. They wanted the um, battle of the sumos turning pro. John was, John actually was willing to do business. He would have, I'm sure John would have done anything that was asked of him to do. When Katow was asked to do business, he balked at it and was like, well, I could kill this guy in real life. And John took exception to that. Say, if you want to go out there and shoot, we can go out there and shoot. I think when they got in the ring, Katow tried a little bit, tried Tenta a little bit, and realized that, hey, if you want to go out there and shoot, you're going to lose, motherfucker. So they had the match. Then they came back, and it's time for the next match on whatever, the second or third night, whatever the hell it was. And Katow tried to shoot on Tenta again. And Tenta shut him down, which angered Katow even more because there had already been several days of promos amongst the boys and, you know, Ryland Tenta up, Ryland Katow up. And 
things like, you know, goddamn, John, he said he's going to fucking throw you into the third row. And, and he said when he gets you down, he's going to make you cry like a little bitch. He said somehow sticking his thumb up your ass or something. And John's getting a little riled up. The other side, you know, they're telling Katow, you know, fuck that big fat fucker. He can't do anything. He's been in the, in the uh, fake wrestling world too long. Have your way with him. Embarrass him. So by the time they got in the ring, both guys, I think, were pretty well hyped up on, I'm going to show the other one who's boss. And Tenta very quickly let Katow know that he was the boss. And Katow didn't like it. Katow rolled out and cut the, the famous Japanese promo. This is all fake it's fake wrestling all that other wonderful crap and Tenta offered to let him come back in the ring he wasn't about to do that because he knew he would get his ass kicked he'd be in Katow so Katow stuck his tail between his legs and headed on back to the house and was done with pro wrestling for a while probably a wise idea uh, yeah, he was a he was he was a dick. He really was. I mean, he probably one of I mean one of uh, Dave Meltzer's favorite people, but he was oh, a God. dick. From here, Earthquake gets in a brief feud with Jake the Snake. They have a match on Superstars, and the match ends with Earthquake tying Roberts in the ropes and splashing the bag. It's allegedly contained Jake Snake Damien. Uh, of course it's been said the bag actually contained, contained pantyhose stuffed with hamburger. <laughs> oh my God. I don't know why this tickles me these days. I feel like you guys would have just gotten destroyed by, by Peter or something like that. Tell we me. got destroyed by Peter then too. Okay. Tell me, tell me how this comes together. We're going to squish a snake. And I think, uh, you called them quake burgers or something like that. We got to hear the whole story. Well, first of all, I think there was a feeling that because it's a snake, no one's really going to get that upset over squishing a snake. But then you realize, no, it's a living, breathing animal. You can't be doing anything to living, breathing animals. Like you can't even squish a spider or anything like that. Um, so the idea was we had to put up the disclaimer that no animals were harmed in this. And we, um, yeah, we, Damien wasn't actually in the bag. <gasps> I know. I just broke the hearts of so many people and I'm squished. <laughs> it's so dumb. I mean, dude, the best part of it though is because when he hit the hit the bag and the bag we wanted it to ooze. <laughs> All right? So that you look like, oh my god, he's he squished this snake and the snake has exploded in there, right? <laughs> so John does it, and then when John gets up, you see the wet spot on his ass. And that was just one of the funniest fucking things in the world because I guess you made it a little too oozy, if you will. Ooh, little less ooh. Little less ooh on the snivy. Yo, prop. Earthquake got an oozy ass now. Somebody help him out. Get over there, blotter dry a little bit. Help Can't me be out. having an oozy ass. Help me understand. Why does Vince love ooze so much? That's not a word I think I hear anywhere else. But you told us once on an old Ultimate Warrior skit. God damn it, we want the ooze. You know, the purple ooze. And now here we needed a snake bag to ooze. This, this is a Vince McMahon word. Is it not? What the fuck? I mean, how you, you have shit oozing in the mortgage business all the time. <laughs> God damn the fucking the mortgage rates are oozing. I've heard you say it a thousand times at least a day. Oh my gosh. Oh, mortgage rates are oozing. Everybody has their own definition of ooze and, and just, uh, gloop and glop and. All that wonderful shit. When the match airs on superstars footage of earthquake landing on Damien is interrupted with cutaway shots of that shows event center. 
The incident would air uninterrupted and uncensored on primetime wrestling the following week. And later in the show, Earthquake would cook Quake burgers on a grill and serve them to co host Vince McMahon, Bobby. That's the where Man, everybody thinks it was hamburger meat. And Lord, because Alfred Snake Hayes. looks like hamburger. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Of he course. just cut it and had, you know, like made like nice little patties out of it. Of course, later in the episode, Earthquake would reveal the meat was ground from Damien's carcass. Heenan had already eaten three or four of the burgers and Hayes was curious about the meat. Earthquake mentioned the animal from which the meat was taken rhymed with quake. And Hayes said they're snake burgers. Hayes gets sick and nearly throws up. Vince is angry, knocks the tray out of Earthquake's hands, which knocks the burgers onto the floor. Roberts and, uh, earthquake feud throughout all of spring and into the summer. Oh man. He killed my snake. This is, this is prime time stuff. If you're a little kid, man, you damn right. It is. And it was something that you know hadn't been done. What do you do to neutralize Jake, the snake? And you've got to take Damien away. Well, how the hell do you do that? You squish him, make him ooze. Make him ooze. Listen to you during this time. Uh, Have you ever oozed Conrad? Uh, thanks to blue Chew, Yeah. Well, then there was that night in Nuevo Laredo, but it stopped oozing after three days. You're off your meds. Uh, during this time, Andre, the giant returns, Actually, and no. gets in, <laughs> involved with this feed. You ain't got no time for. Pill alarms anymore. I ain't got no time for that. No. Uh, we see a series of skits on TV where various managers are all trying to recruit Andre. And the skits end with Jimmy Hart announcing that Andre is the newest member of the group, only to have Andre turn on him, of course. Earthquake then clips Andre's knee, and after that, Andre starts using crutches whenever he's on TV. Andre appears in Jake's corner in the last series of matches with the Earthquake in the summer of nineteen ninety one. The finish usually coming when Giant would or Andre, the giant would uh, strike earthquake with one of his metal crutches. Why is Andre involved in this? Is this just a way to give earthquake a little bit of rub of working with a legend like Andre? I mean, clearly Andre's hurting for certain here. He was, and, and this was right about the time I was leaving. I did shoot all those vignettes with the managers trying to recruit Andre. Most of that we shot in Vegas, but it was Andre's Andre wanted to do it. Andre wanted to work with him and continue to be out on the road. Andre probably should have had another back surgery at that point and was hurting. Andre was hurting, but he didn't, he felt that if he went home and didn't work, that he was going to die and maybe not that drastic, but that was the feeling that, you know, Andre just had to be out. He wanted to be out around his friends. He wanted to be on the road and he wanted to be Andre. So Vince obliged. Vince was willing to do whatever it took and get, you know, get boss out there and keep him on the road. Let's, uh, let's keep it moving here. And later in 1991 tugboat turns heel changes his name to typhoon and joins Jimmy Hart's group. He and earthquake are going to form a team called the natural disasters. Uh, believe it or not, this is Dave Silva's favorite tag team. I can't believe that's the thing. I don't know if, because you know, he just likes big fat guys. I guess that explains why he likes me. I don't know, but chat me up the natural disasters. What's the thinking here? Well, they are. It's goddamn typhoon and dadgum earthquake. They're natural disasters. I, and during the time, I don't know, I'm trying to think. Um, Jimmy Hart was referencing earthquake as a natural disaster. And so the two just kind of came together, and now you've got an earthquake and you have a typhoon, and you've got a tag team of the natural disasters and it made sense and they were one hell of a tag team. Good Lord. You know, how are you going to compete with those two big bastards and it gave new life to tugboat because tugboat is tugboat. Eh -eh. Let's, uh, let's remind everybody they do have, um, 
quite the success here. They immediately start a feud with the tag team champions, the Legion of Doom. They're wrestling each other for the titles at the 92 Royal Rumble. Natural disasters get the win by count out. So Legion of Doom keeps the tag titles. And Meltzer would say this was actually the best match I've seen these four have, but that says more about how bad the other matches have been. But it was okay until the cheap finish where everyone was brawling on the floor and Typhoon got in to beat the count. With all the time they spent booking the rest of the card, they must have spent the time it takes between bites of a roast beef sandwich to come up with the finish here. And it gives it a star and a half. But listen, this is rarefied air here. I mean, there there was a term in the business called the Road Warrior Pop. And if you're working with the Road Warriors, you're in a prime time spot and they're the tag champs and it's on pay-per-view. Quite the push for the natural disasters. You know, we've heard over the years that Vince was a body guy. But here, maybe this isn't the type of body he's normally looking for, but he's got the size and spades with the natural disasters. And, uh, I don't know. It probably made sense to put him in there with the Legion of doom. what do you think of their rumble match? I'm mean, clearly a count out is not exactly what we'd all be looking for, but you got a lot of beef in there. You definitely do. And, and to that point, I think that the body guy thing, people see it one way and then there's the reality of it. You're looking at size. You're looking at someone larger than life that has a, that has a presence. They have a unique look and they have a presence and both earthquake and Tenta had a presence. When they walked through an airport, people looked, people would look at them and go, Holy shit, man. Those are two big bastards. What the hell do they do? Then you start getting into it and more is, you know, more comes out of it. So they were someone that definitely were, they were able to go. Both guys could go Tenta, especially still at this point. But, um, as far as, you know, the road warriors, natural opponents. And I dare say that, the natural disasters probably got more out of the road warriors for that big man collision type match than anybody did. We, um, we don't see a rematch at WrestleMania eight, which I I think probably at Royal rumble, I would have just assumed, Oh, they're going to do that again. Uh, WrestleMania eight winds up being money Inc and natural disasters. But before we get there, we should say, the natural disasters actually turn face when Jimmy Hart turns on them and joins forces with money Inc money Inc. Of course, had just won the tag titles from Legion of doom with a name like natural disasters and this feud with Hulk Hogan in the not so distant memory. What's the thinking in turning these guys, baby face two big bastards that the audience believed in. Regardless of whether you liked them or not, you believed them. So they were out there and it was a situation where you could just flip the opponents and whoever they were wrestling, if they were, if they were wrestling heels, then they would be the baby faces. Let's, uh, let's talk about WrestleMania eight. They do get their, uh, tag title shot again, this time against money Inc. But Meltzer did not like it. Uh, natural disasters get a win by count out the same way, you know, they've won a lot of these matches. Um, Meltzer would say, oh, this was bad. Disasters aren't over his faces one lick and worked so badly that the crowd didn't have a lick of interest in the match. Typhoon was far worse than usual, which is a mouthful. Typhoon splashed IRS and Jimmy Hart pulled him out of the ring and they walked back to the dressing room for the count out loss. The fans in the building who no matter how many times they see this have always popped for the count out thinking the titles change hands. Didn't care. One iota horrible match and an even worse finish. Negative two stars. Ah, less than awesome. what did you think of the WrestleMania eight match? Eh, I wasn't there at the time and just is Pat Patterson would say me. Actually, it's more like what Eugene would say. Yeah. Didn't like it. Didn't care. This is the first time we should mention, uh, in earthquakes run so far, you know, going back to 89, that he's a baby face. Do you think he had, do you think Tinta had a preference baby face or heel? 
I think most talent that have ever worked heel enjoy being a heel. Of course. It's just so much more fun. Uh, it's easier, but it's also more, a lot more fun. In July of 92, right before you come back at a house show in Worcester, the natural disasters defeat money Inc for the tag titles. This does beg the question. If they're going to win the titles anyway, why not do it on pay-per-view? Do you have any, I know you weren't there, but do you have any insights why the tag title switch here would have happened at a house show? Every once in a while you do that to let people know that it could happen in your town too. So the next time that the championship is up for grabs and you're saying, well, no, it's going to happen at a pay-per-view. I'll just wait. No, by God, it could happen in Huntsville, Abilama. Probably not though. No, uh, it's it at SummerSlam, the natural disasters. You would... wait. <laughs> All right. Listen up Huntsville. When, when house shows are a thing again, if a title change happens here in Huntsville, it's just because I challenged Bruce. So hashtag you're welcome. Uh, at SummerSlam, the how do you know, how do you know, we're not going to do it and say Kansas city. Well, you, cause I said it wouldn't happen in Huntsville and you got pissed and said, you wait, <laughs> like, uh, despite yeah, well, it could. the IC title there, it's sticking up Conrad's ass. How about now? Motherfucker. We'll switch the damn universal championship there. Oh, that, on that. I, okay. Let's see. You're welcome. Huntsville. That's never happened before here. At SummerSlam, the natural disaster successfully defend the titles against the Beverly brothers. Uh, of course the Beverly brothers are the former destruction Q, or destruction crew. Easy for me to say in the AWA, I, I was never a Beverly brothers guy. I couldn't get into it. You know, I could appreciate they had a cool look and blah, 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 but it was just a miss for me. Uh, what can you tell us about their match at SummerSlam or anything at all about the Beverly brothers you'd like to share? Oh my God. Great guys. Really great guys. Um, from Minnesota and Wayne Bloom was just, was one of the strongest humans on the face of the earth. Doesn't look like it looks like a tall, skinny guy, right? But, uh, incredible strength. But, uh, both of those guys were just so easy to get along with both tremendous workers in their own right, but it just kind of, Eh, you know, um, they clicked as a team. They were good. Just the audience never really cared for whatever reason. If you were to get, this is another example of, if you were to be able to get Bloom and Enos, the real human being, they were funny, they were entertaining, and legit athletes. You, I don't know. It just, you couldn't get them on camera. And the audience didn't care. Well, the natural disasters hold the titles until October 13th. Then they lose them back to money Inc in Regina or sorry, Regina. Well, that takes us to the 92 survivor series, natural disasters. And the nasty boys are going to beat money Inc and the Beverly brothers in an elimination tag match. Most would say the work itself was solid from start to finish, except in spots where the nasty boys didn't seem to be using baby face moves and money Inc had to walk themselves through the move earthquake pinned Bo Beverly with the uh, splash in nine minutes and 25 seconds, which gave the faces a four on two advantage psychologically. That's pretty hard to get a lot of the crowd reaction when the heels are getting pounded while being outmanned. IRS would pin Typhoon for a second fall when after DiBiase trips him, and the third fall lasted five seconds with Sags pinning IRS with a schoolboy. He gives it a star and a quarter. And then, you know, I can't believe this happened this way. But the night after the Royal Rumble 1993 show, Earthquake loses to uh, the Bam Bam Bigelow character here by count out and he leaves the company. And this just seems like, I don't know that he was with you guys a lot longer, you know, debuting on TV in late 89, I think November 89 is the first time I saw him. 
And now here in January of 93, he's out of here. I mean, he's not here very long, but he made the most of it. Did he not? Yes, he did. And at this point in his career, I think Tenta was looking for something else. He wanted to go back to Japan and was kind of tired of being on the road. I think he was living at the time. I think he was living in Seattle or something like that. So the trips were hard. My God, if you're going to, if you're going to live somewhere and you travel the country the way that we do, I wouldn't pick Seattle as a place to live or any place on the West coast, but to each his own. And the travel was tough for John. It's done. Well, yeah. And he's a big boy, you know? So if you're making cross country trips, you know, twice a week like that with lots of connections and you're a big boy, it's probably a challenge. Uh, not, not exactly comfortable. He does go back to Japan for the war promotion. He has a brief stint in Mexico, CMLL in late 93, um, at the Monday night raw taping on January 31st in Bushkill PA earthquake shows up as a face making the save for Bret Hart as he's wrestling Shawn Michaels and diesel keeps interfering. What leads to, uh, earthquake coming back here in early 94, he just needed some time off the road. And now that he's had like a year hiatus, he's ready to get back in the swing of things. Yes. He wanted, you know, again, be careful what you wish for sometimes. Cause you may get it. So John had, had done that gig, man. He had been out on the road doing the Japan stuff. And I think that he realized, wait a minute, I'm missing the money. I'm missing the guys that I've been traveling up and down the road with for a while and decided he wanted to come on back. If there's an expert about be careful what you wish for, it's probably Bruce Pritchard, right? You know, I worked as the expert in the GWF. Oh, we get questions about that a lot. Careful talking about that. We'll have a thousand follow-ups. Let's talk about, uh, what he's doing when he comes back here. Earthquake starts a feud with Bastion Booger. And work several house shows with him, usually with Earthquake winning by pin. Earthquake is back at WrestleMania at WrestleMania 10. He's going to pin Adam Bomb in 35 seconds with the Earthquake splash. Uh, Meltzer would write Harvey Whippleman started making fun of Howard Finkel with a new hairpiece and ripped his tux. Finkel shoved down Whippleman. Bomb then snatched Finkel, but Quake made the save and won almost immediately. This is a little weird, is it not? I mean, this earthquake segment. This is a guy who has headlined pay-per-views against Hulk Hogan. And now, well, he's just fought her here to get over a Winkle hairpiece and, and, and tuck skit, right? He was, it was a big, that was a major, major story. Oh my goodness. Earthquake winds up putting over Yokozuna on the house shows. And on the May 16th raw earthquake would take on Yokozuna in a sumo wrestling match on raw earthquake wins the match by pushing Yoko out of the ring. And the match actually does a 3.5 rating. Is this the original pitch to him? I mean, in 94, it's definitely Yoko time. And for you guys to bring him back here, it does feel like, Hey, he has a sumo background. We can do something with him and Yoko. Was that the plan all along? And it just took till May to get around to it. It was, you know, no, it, it kind of just happened. And the feeling was we wanted to keep them apart, really. But then you just got down to it and it was a natural. So we got there. But when Yoko first came in and, and Tenta and everybody being there, it was something you looked at and said, well, bam, that's a rifle shot. Go there. But it just didn't feel like it was the right time. Let's, uh, let's keep it moving here and talk about the fact that almost right after this Yokozuna thing, he's out of here. Um, earthquake is supposed to face Owen Hart in the King of the ring qualifying match uh, during the May 14th, 1994 house show in San Jose earthquake had been injured by Yokozuna and crush and footage of Yoko hitting a bonsai drop at the show was televised before the qualifying match to explain his absence in which doink the clown was his replacement. And Meltzer would write, Doink replaced Earthquake, who apparently quit the promotion. 
because they really did a burial number on him in the commentary, claiming an injury on, in Anaheim on May 14th. Quake was really upset in Anaheim about having to do the clean job for Yokozuna. And after he leaves, he goes back to Japan again to work for the war promotion. What's the story with this very, very brief run here in 94, where he's back in January, but out by May, was he upset about finishes or was this just a time when houses were down? And as a result, everybody's paydays were down all the above. And in particular, I think that quake was feeling what we were feeling that we were going to wait on the Yoko issue and that we would build to that a little bit more than what we actually did. So from earthquake standpoint, it's like, Hey, I thought I was going to be in the picture and that this is going to take a little bit of a while and then bam, we're right there and we're in it. So for him, he's thinking, well, this was the biggest thing I'm coming back for and doing it. Money wasn't good. And at the time people thinking Ted Turner on the other side, the grass was greener on the other side. You're exactly right. He winds up in the, in WCW later that same year. Was this not a surprise to see him in, in WCW? I mean, Hogan goes to WCW. So I think a lot of people assume, oh, well, he's going to bring his band of brothers. I don't know necessarily that you would classify earthquake in that category, but he's certainly an opponent that Hogan quote unquote drew money with. Was it any surprise to you to see him pop up for WCW? No, no, not at all, because he was close with Hogan and it was a natural opponent for Hogan and someone that Hulk felt comfortable with. And as you say, drew money with Earthquake, so why not bring him? And that was during the time of all of the promises, man. The grass is green over here, guaranteed money, come on over. Well, he stays there until 1997. Uh, During his time there, he would work as Avalanche and Shark and the dungeon of doom. And then even under his real name, John Tenta before leaving WCW in, in 97, but he pops up for you guys, uh, May 25th, 1998. It's raw is war and John Tent is back, but this time he's not earthquake. He's wearing a mask and calling himself Golga. And, uh, he's going to join the group, the oddities. Of course, Golga, the character is a big fan of Cartman from South park, carries a toy of him to the ring. Chat me up. Uh, what did John think of this idea? This feels like this has Russo's fingerprints all over it. Well, yeah. Um, but actually the, you know, the funny thing is, is I met with Tenta and Vince and kind of made that meeting happen because John was, was looking for, for more and he at this point he was looking for work he just wanted to come in and and do whatever he was disillusioned with wcw and wanted to make it right at the time coming in we had this guy giant silva um also kurgan who was a big guy and vince is like hmm We've done the earthquake. You've been these other names at WCW. And the only thing I ever remember him was like wearing some kind of shark paint on his face in WCW. So I don't remember much of what John did in WCW. But when he came back, this was like, because I don't want to bring earthquake back. Maybe we could put him under a mask and, and do a deformity. So the mask was with a big lump on his head that you, you saw and went, who the hell is that? You might've thought it was earthquake because of the size and everything, but now what's this huge lump growing out of his head underneath that mask? Um, and the oddities were born. That was, that was it, man. What a weird, (laughs) I don't know, man. It's just, you think that shit, in WCW with the dungeon of doom can't get any weirder. And, and now we've got the oddities. This is just one weird. Thing. I hated, I hated, hated, hated the oddities. Um, but damn, if they didn't get a reaction, that crowd, they love to see, they love the entrance and they love the dance, the matches that bell rang. Yeah. But the entrance and the dancing, the audience loved. 
Yeah. I mean, listen, it's hard to argue that they weren't getting over. I mean, they definitely were, but that dungeon of doom stuff was so terrible. And I was such a big fan of what earthquake did with Hulk Hogan back in the day that I don't know, just made me sad. And then he pops up here under a mask. And by the way, it does look like he's dropped quite a few pounds here when he's doing Golga for y'all compared to when he was here as earthquake. Right. He definitely had. Yes. He came back and not so much earthquake shape being really big, but he, he looked good during this time. He probably dropped about 30, 40 pounds. We, um, we got to keep going here and talk about SummerSlam 98 because the oddities defeat Kai and Tai in a handicap match. And of course, Kai and Tai is Takamichi Noku, Men's Teow, Shofunaki, and Dick to go. Uh, the oddities were defeated by the headbangers when the insane clown posse turned on them at the in your house, rock bottom pay-per-view, which happened in Tenta's hometown of Vancouver. And the oddities would lose to the headbangers at the 99 Royal rumble. Golga then finds himself in the Royal rumble match coming in number three, but he's quickly eliminated by Steve Austin. Fast forward a couple of months and John is released in April of 99. Had the Golga thing just, or the oddities thing just sort of ran its course and McMahon was tired of it and creative just didn't have anything for him. Or was there something else to this release? No, I think that the time had come. There just wasn't, wasn't a lot of equity in the oddities. And I don't know. There was a lot of longevity either. Let's, uh, let's talk about John Tenta's plans after the release. He opens the John Tenta school of professional wrestling. And would promote shows with himself and his students under the name of intense Florida wrestling in 2001, John comes back to the WWF for two appearances as earthquake. He's in the 20 man gimmick battle Royal at WrestleMania 17. And in December, uh, he works a dark match prior to a taping of SmackDown. Talk me through this. I understand bringing him back for the gimmick battle Royal, but why aren't we having him work dark matches to see if there's any meat on the bone. I mean, don't you know what he can do? Yeah, but you hadn't seen him in a while. Wanted to make sure that he could still go the way that he used to go. And a big part of his attraction was how well he moved in the ring. You need to know that, that quickness and agility is still there. Ultimately it doesn't work out. And John officially retires from wrestling in 2004 after it was revealed that he had developed bladder cancer. He's told he's only given a 20% chance to live, assuming he continues with the chemotherapy treatments in August of 04, John wrote, I've never been kicked in the balls as hard as I was this past Wednesday, thinking I was licking this thing. I met with my chemo doctor ready to quake the cancer. Well, I now have a tumor in my left lung and two lymph nodes are enlarged in my heart. I go in for chemo tomorrow for a four day session. I've been given 13 to 18 months to live. I'm not giving up and hope to, of course, live longer, but that is what I've been told and that it is incurable. I don't really know what else to say. It all caught me off guard. I'll try to keep you posted, but no guarantees folks. Thank you for all your kind support and may God bless you all. And during his November 18th, 2005 interview on WrestleCrap radio, John announced that a recent radiation dosage did not go as planned and had no effect on the tumor. He also announced that multiple tumors had now spread to his lungs. And sadly, he passed away on June 7th, 2006. And it's just way too damn young. I mean, this is a guy who was born in 63. So to lose him in 2006, my goodness. Did you keep in touch with John? after he was gone or, I mean, when you found out about the diagnosis, was there any sort of conversation that you know of? Yeah. John had moved to Houston and John was going to MD Anderson in Houston for his cancer care. Same place that my wife goes and sitting in one of the waiting rooms. Uh, I remember seeing a big guy walking through the hospital with that same kind of gait, you know, as John Tenta, he was completely bald and thinking to myself, wow, that, that looks an awful lot like Tenta. And by the time I got up to go over there, he was gone. So I'm thinking, eh, I'm seeing things. 
and then the next week we were there same bat time same bat channel and saw the same guy and i got up and i ran him down and it was tenta and he told me everything that was going on with him and um talked about his battle and we talked about my wife's battle and sat in the, you know sat in the waiting area there and just cried like babies and shit and and uh hugged each other exchanged numbers and um we were gonna like have dinner at the house and cook out and shit and john was gone just that fast what do you think his legacy so, will be in professional wrestling I think his legacy is going to be as the earthquake. And I think it's going to be the guy that, you know, took Hogan down the way that he did on the brother love show. I mean, that was to me, that's his legacy. That's one thing everybody points back to and looks at. And I think he will go in the hall of fame. Um, cause he was a huge star and he was a hell of an athlete and a good guy. And gone way too soon. I mean, I think he died. Well, oh my God, way too soon. Just a couple of weeks shy of his 43rd birthday. So, you know, 42, my goodness, uh, to, to have a battle with cancer like this. And I'm, as you said, that's something you're familiar with and whew, it's tough. We, uh, we took to Twitter and said, Hey, on an upcoming something to wrestle, we'll be discussing the one and only earthquake have questions for Bruce, drop them in the replies and be sure to use the hashtag ask Bruce. And if you've got a question for next week's episode, you should follow us at Pritchard show. And that's where you'll be able to ask your questions. We should mention that, uh, I can tell that this was Dave Silva who posted this tweet looking for questions because all of the pictures that were chosen. (laughs) are of uh, earthquake when he's a part of the, uh, natural disasters. He's got that natural disasters look, which I know that's our pals. Um, let's get to, uh, some of the questions here. There's no way we get to all of them. We've got like 300 different questions. Friends of the show, uh, bad money slam writes. If this man came along 10 years later in wrestling, he could have been one of the biggest things during the Monday night war. What say you Bruce? And he, he included a photo that I, I think everybody should go see over at Pritchard show and it's Tenta in Japan doing a drop kick and he's got some height, some serious height on the drop kick. And I think a lot of people probably assume that his style and his physical ability is going to be one thing based on the number on the scale. But then you see him pull out a drop kick like this and you're like, wait, what the fuck just happened? What do you think if he was, uh, maybe coming along 10 years later, would it have been a different story for him? I don't know. I thought he had a pretty damn good story. And I thought the Tenta had a hell of a career and a great run with Hogan and was a top star for a long time. I would he have done well 10 years later? Yeah, sure. Definitely would have, but I don't think there's anything wrong with the time he came by and what he did during his time. Lots of questions like this. Uh, you made me cry when earthquake squashed Hogan, you bastard. Why was earthquake not given the title that comes to us from Phil Milan, but lots of people had the question, Hey, he's working on top with Hogan. Why was he not given the title? And I know in the past, Bruce, you've told us, well, it's a baby face territory. And I get that. So we got to have that. But macho man was world champ when he was a bad guy. And, uh, of course we go that Sergeant slaughter is going to be world champ when he's a bad guy. Couldn't that same thing have applied for earthquake in this era? Yeah. Yes. But everybody can't be champion. Oh, I like that guy. Why isn't he champion? Earthquake earthquake was the opponent and not everybody can be champion. The Rosen coaster writes the reputation over the years of earthquake was that he was one of the safest big men to work with in wrestling. If that's the case, uh, why didn't he work with the undertaker who was tasked to work with big men and lacked in skill? that earthquake possessed. That is interesting. I don't remember seeing an earthquake undertaker match. Did that ever happen to the best of your knowledge? No. And I think they were pretty much heels at the same time. And, but I don't really know other than it just didn't pan out at the time. Would have been a hell of, would have been a hell of a program. If you ask me, Jonathan Wagner has a couple of fun questions here. Uh, he says, who's looked 40 most of their life more. Tenta, 
Arn Anderson or JJ Dillon? Oh God. Je- well, first of all, JJ's never looked 40 in his life. I think JJ went from like 15 to 52. <laughs> the statement. Um, I mean, JJ's always looked like an old man. Yeah. He's always been 50. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, John's John's up there. I, I thought the first time that I met him that he was much older. And then when I found out he was the same age as me, I was like, damn. So I'll give it to Tenta, because yeah, JJ never, ever, ever looked 40. Arn, same thing. Arn looked like Arn looks like he's like 49 and a half since the time that he cut his hair from being Marty Lundy with his little bleach blonde hair and shit. Jonathan wants to know what's the difference between a Canadian earthquake and a regular earthquake. Big difference. About 70%. Well, I was going to say the Canadian earthquake costs more money and, uh, doesn't offend anyone. Eh? Hey, uh, Mike Miller has a great question. Did Tita ever squish someone on purpose as a receipt or spite? I'm sure he would have loved to have squished old Koji Katow, but no, John was professional and handled himself well in the ring. And I don't think that there was anybody in the wrestling business that would ever want to try to anger him to see what he's made of because Tenta could go, but he never, ever intentionally hurt anyone to my knowledge. Josh Crompton wants to know, ever thought about a program with Vader in 98 instead of the oddities angle that could have been good, huh? Would have been different. Yeah. I just think that, you know, it may have just been like a a big, big man blob match at that point in their careers though. Uh, Jonathan wants to know, was there ever any thoughts of adding the Texas tornado with the natural disasters? Seems like it would have fit. Now that's fun. Fucking A. That now that's see, that's thinking right there. (laughs) Uh, James Shea wants to know where does earthquake rank in terms of all time, big men. And where do you rank the natural disasters all time? Well, I, I rank the natural disasters right up there with the twin towers. As far as big man tag teams go, um, probably the, as far as that big man, they're number two because the twin towers, I just thought they were an excellent tag team and gelled and, and were at their peak and then would be the natural disasters. As far as earthquake is one of the top big men. Um, I put him above Bundy. That's for sure, because he could go and he could work and do a lot more than Bundy. Um, you know, Andre's always going to be number one. But Earthquake would have to be top five. Top five. How How's was, that? I was wondering. I'm like, man, you're taking a long time to get around to saying top five. Let's uh, let's keep it going here. A couple more. Uh, this is a fun one. And... Uh, I don't know. I can't wait to hear your take. Mr. JB 79 wants to know, Bruce, what tasted better quake burgers or pepper steak? Well, I actually had some quake burgers. They were good. It's just tremendous that there's so many angles in the WWF where, and then we fed him his own snake and then we fed him his own dog. <laughs> uh, Adam has an interesting question and you're going to have to think about this one. Maybe you won't, but. These are the type of detailed questions that I enjoy getting to the bottom of. He says, was the attack on Hulk Hogan on the brother love show filmed twice in the WWF magazine. They have pictures of Hulk being carried out with his shirt still on. So that's interesting to me because we have heard over the years that sometimes Vince would say, no, God damn it. Go do it again and make it look like this. Well, apparently the version on TV didn't exactly line up with the version in the magazine. So it does lend itself to maybe it being shot twice. Do you remember? I don't, I know we shot the boss man one twice. I don't think we shot the earthquake one twice. It may have been that they took it from somewhere else or where we might've done a dry run or something like that. But the angle for TV, I'm pretty sure we only did once. I could be wrong, but, um, I don't remember that. Concuss Jones wants to know, did you ever talk to him about the meaning of the tiger tattoo? I don't know why, but at the time it always stuck out to me. Can't say that I have. Andrew Campbell wants to know, did John Tenta really have gills? 
Yes. Behind his ears, like, where everybody's are. This is uh, <laughs> Eric writes. I got to see Hogan and Quake in Macon, nineteen ninety one. Quake got wheeled out on a stretcher, and on his way down the aisle, we see a boatload of Quake pubes popping out of his trunks. Did the WWF have any grooming standards to avoid traumatizing children like myself? Boy, this would be a great spot for a Manscaped commercial right now, would it not? Oh, no shit. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, man, it feels like every other question that we've gotten is about why was there no blow off with Hogan on TV? Why did Hogan, why did he never get the world title? It's pretty remarkable that this guy who seemingly was not around all that long, man, he had such an impression on, on guys my age. I mean, do you think that's more about uh, his look and, and, and his performance, is it more about the fact that he was working with Hogan uh, or was it just it was, the, the, the time that the company's so hot that anybody doing anything on TV in that era is, is going to be over like Rover. Yeah. It was working with Hogan and his size, but not, he just wasn't a big man. He was a big man that could move. He was deceptively quick and subconsciously. I think that's why it stuck with people because he could, he was an athlete and could go man. That's crazy. Right. The natural disasters only had a two year run. Why such a short run was Tenta's contract up. I would have loved to have seen one to two more years of that team, as opposed to the shock master, a, a short time later. The, I mean, the natural disasters, I, I have to admit they were not my guys. So I don't understand the obsession, but man, we apparently have Dave Silva included a ton of natural disaster super fans. Does that surprise you? No, because we also have a shitload of twin tower fans. I think people like the larger than life heels and stars that can go. And it was a unique tag team. They were big and they were bad and People were afraid of what they would do to their favorites. Interesting question from JT he says when earthquake came in, was there any, ever any thought to pairing him with Bobby Heenan? I love the mouth of the South, but his stable never seemed to be as big of a threat to Hogan as the Heenan family stable was. That's a great question because I mean, it felt like if you're working with Hogan, man, across the aisle somewhere, whoever Bobby Heenan's latest villain is that could have worked too, huh? It could have. I mean, it could have worked with Slick, and, and we tried it out with Slick as well, but it ended up being Jimmy Hart, and I think that that was a, a good decision. Talk to me about his weight loss. Matt writes in, was John's weight loss throughout the years his decision, or was it from the higher-ups? And that comes to us because we've talked a lot about you know, Vince wanting Vader and Mark Henry and Big Show, guys like that, to lose weight. Was this a conversation you guys had with John? John wanted to lose weight to ease up on his knees and he just needed to do it to be able to move better. And Vince supported it a hundred percent made him healthier. He, he just was tired of carrying that much weight. Zahara writes, I was at a live Bret Hart Q and a, and he said that John Tenta was the toughest person he ever met, even over Haku. What's your thoughts? Uh, I would say definitely one of. Yes. Legit, tough, scary human being. Rory wants to know, was there ever any serious thought to adding a third member to the natural disasters? And if so, who would it have been? Of course. Uh, you gave me the Texas tornado earlier. That's just such an easy given. Yeah. I mean, in hindsight, it feels like a missed opportunity. Eric Boyd wants to know, is he a man or is he a shark? what do you think of John Tenta's work in WCW? And did you see any of it? I saw some of the Dungeon of Doom stuff where he had the shark face painted on his face, and I just thought it was ridiculous, but it was it was kind of funny. Real David Wilk wants to know, were there any other plans for him at WrestleMania 7? Seems like he went from Hogan to a mid-card squash against the Hammer. We sort of touched on this earlier, but you know we've often heard you guys would sort of book WrestleMania to WrestleMania and work backwards, but it does feel like he was sort of lost in the shuffle by the time WrestleMania 7 came around. Was that just because of 
all the craziness going on behind the scenes of the move from the Coliseum to the arena and the controversy surrounding the Sergeant Slaughter Iraqi sympathizer angle. I, no, he was just coming off an incredibly hot and big run with Hogan. And, and it just, it was a transition period for him. That's all. Spaghetti arms wants to know what was the reason for earthquake to constantly move up and down during his promos. Cause it's a goddamn earthquake. He's like, he's tremoring. I'm with you on that. I think what he's looking for is, was that a, a cue from you or Vince McMahon? I mean, it is one of his trademarks. So uh, when you're thinking about the earthquake character, who says, Hey, what if Do you recall? I don't even understand the question. Okay. Well, I mean, you're, you're shooting promos backstage, right? A, a ton of vignettes and some guys would uh, do their little steepling hand gimmicks. And some guys would turn around and some guys would scream at the camera and you know, we know something. I mean, everybody has those little cues. Did he come up with the mounts thing or would that have been something that a producer would have said, Hey man, why don't you try? Well, we told him to continue to move throughout. So that's what he did. So yes, it was a direction, you know, be moving, uh, the whole time that's would be best. So, well, listen, that's going to put a bow on this week's episode. I wanted to uh, talk about this character and this run for so long, uh, because I had such an impression on me and I hope that some of you will go check out the quake burger segment, the brother love segment, the debut with Dino Bravo. There's so many big moments that he had and just a really, a, a, a short time span. I mean, I can't think of many other guys who were with us as, as small of a run as he had time wise and accomplished so much, but there it is. And next week we'll be back with you for vengeance 2005. On top, it's a Hell in a Cell match with Batista and Triple H. We've got a triple threat match with Christian, Chris Jericho, and John Cena. We've got Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle. We've got Kane working with Edge. We've got Victoria and Krista Hemi. And we've got Carlito and Shelton Benjamin for the Intercontinental title. Man, you want to talk about in-ring talent. There is a ton on this card, is there not? Can't wait, can't wait. It's next week. Don't you dare miss it right here on Westwood One. Vengeance 2005 on something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Shaka Khan. No lunch today. Oh, and watch SmackDown tonight, kids. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.